Hello, I'm Carla Rappaport, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our Kadath Lumen Art Talk, curating an exhibition post COVID-19. I'm so glad you could be with us today. I'm executive director of Lumen Art Projects, a UK-based nonprofit, which produces, curates, exhibitions, commissions, and events using art that intersects with science and technology. Our network of more than 400 artists globally is drawn from our annual juried competition, the Lumen Prize for Art and Technology. Launched in 2012, every year, artists who are longlisted, shortlisted, or who, who have won an award are immediately eligible for opportunities that Lumen Art Projects develops with its partners worldwide. I'm pleased to say that one of those partners is the Solendet Kunstmuseum in Christiansen, Norway, whose digital curator, Toral Hogan, is joining us today. I'm also delighted to say that today's panel is about happy news. It's about an exhibition that went ahead despite the pandemic and is now open to visitors in Norway. We're going to hear how our panelists adjusted to the new challenges, learn how they cope, and how they ensured that despite this pandemic, and despite that two of the artists for the exhibition were based in the US, the show went on. First, I'm gonna introduce our SKMU partner and she'll give us a little bit of a context about how the exhibition fits into the ambitions that the museum has for itself and in the future. And then I'll introduce my fellow colleague who worked with Toro on the exhibition, Jack Gaddis, and following that, we'll have a panel discussion. So I'd like to hand over now to Toro. Thank you, Carla. It's really nice to be here. I'm very glad. Um, my name is Toril, and yes, I work for Sörlands Kunstmuseum and have been working here for the last year. Um, let me just show you before we start, before I share a little bit about some images from, from my museum, where we are today and where we are going. If you look at the first one, you can see this is the museum where we are located today and the museum has been here since 1995. It is traditionally a museum for the region that we are in and a few years ago it was given a large collection of Nordic modernism and that kind of sparked I think um, the idea that we really needed a new place to be because it's a large collection of 3,000 um, works and so for the last few years we have worked towards this idea of being in a new location that can really host everything that we want to be for the future. So let me see where, let me show you where we are moving. We are moving to the, it's the next uh, slide. Um, yeah, uh, yes, this one. Uh, we are moving to Odrea, but not far from here, down by the harbor. It's a beautiful area where we, where we have museums, we have a really nice uh, theater. Uh, the art education is there and it's really it will almost be like a hub for creativity here in Christian Sounds. I can show you just a little bit of the process. We just started renovating this old um, silo from built in the 1930s by a very famous architect that really fits the area for the, of the modernism that we are kind of that will be inside the building that we will show there. Um, and next to it, you can see the um, building. And yeah, this is what it will look like in 2022, where we are, yeah, uh, really working hard for that to happen. <laughs> so I will give an overview just from the area, from, from the uh, place, the last one, and then we can, I can share a little bit what I'm doing at the moment. So this is, this is where the new art silo in Kristiansand will be. And uh, actually they are planning where you can take a boat from the airport to the museum, <laughs> just like in Venice. Well, uh, yeah, I work for the museum and for the last year I've been preparing a little bit how we can re-establish art and technology here in our museum. This is really an ambition we have for the new museum where we really want to um, be a leading museum for art and technology in Norway and even maybe in, in the Nordic countries. We are looking for partners in the Nordic countries and also we've been looking for partners internationally and that's how we, that's how I, I, I got that connection with the Lumen Prize. I will share a little bit about that later. Um, and so my, my job is to prepare 
you know, even like, um, you know, what will the white box look like? And what, what is really needed for art for the future, which is a lot of practical and, you know, technical things, uh, which Lumen has been really helpful in that process as well. And we, I'm working also with the uh, education side. You see the image behind me. It's a beautiful painting of Raidar Auli. And we are really looking into how we can really create this super photography that people can really enter into those kind of paintings and really learn a lot more, even maybe through Im immersive experience and things like that. So there's a lot of different things, but um, the greatest ambition we have for, for the future is to, to really, of course, host the, the new collection from the Alco Foundation that we have been given and also be a leading museum in the arts tech scene. Great. Well, thank you very much, Toral. That was a wonderful introduction. So I'd like to now bring our second panelist on, who is Jack Addis, introduce him, and then we'll get into the panel discussion. So before joining Lumen Art Projects, Jack spent several years in the art and technology world running exhibitions and art events in Bristol, where he graduated. He then moved to London and worked as a, for a private art dealer's assistant and managed a gallery and then gained a master's degree in digital fine art from the University of Arts London, Camberwell, which is where he made his link to Luminar Projects. In the four years he's been with Luminar Projects, he's curated and produced exhibitions and commissions with our partners around the world, most recently in the UK, USA, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and China. And he um, is in charge of managing ongoing partnerships with the Barbican Center in the UK, Eureka, the National Children's Museum in the north of the UK, and of course SKMU in Norway, and Silent Media Lab in Russia, amongst others. So now I'd like to open up some questions to Toral and Jack, who handled this exhibition since the beginning. And my first question to both of you well, actually, let's start, Toro. First of all, can you start with a brief overview of what the exhibition actually was conceived as and how you came up with the idea and how our partnership evolved? Maybe you could give us some of the history of the project, which I know I can tell our viewers already is called Re.Memory. So I'll give over now to Toro to give us a little history of how it all got set up to start. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think it all started when I came to the Lumen Awards in London last year, actually. Um, I had some interest in, I, I've seen some of Refik Anadol's work earlier, just online. And I was looking at some other artists there. And I was just like, yeah, it really struck me, you know, these two artists found that their, their work kind of, for me, corresponded somehow. Um, and, and the way it all started is that I approached Carla on the opening, just sharing very briefly, I mean it's a busy night for her, but just sharing very briefly about who, who I am, where I come from, and, and the future ambition of our museum. And then we just reconnected after it and started talking. And uh, it was just such a great help for me, uh, you know, establishing this um, art tech scene here at the museum. Even if I worked for, with it for 10 years before, it, it's a new beginning kind of. And it was just really very helpful for me to, to see how Lumen Price really helps the work with the artist, almost like, you know, a gallery for many uh, visual artists, uh, you know, they, they really, so, yeah, connect uh, the artist with the, with the museum world. Jack, Jack, maybe you could talk about the artist liaison process for this show, maybe pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, how you reached out to the two artists and your discussions before you knew you had these problems, mm -hmm. and then how, it, it, how the relationship developed. Sure. So after some discussions between the three of us, we kind of, you know, we were thinking about having Rafiq and Suwen Chung um, as the artist for the exhibition. Um, so my role then would usually, or was, to connect with both Sogwen and Rafik and explain to them the project that we were going to be doing, um, the kind of th the parameters of the project, who, who, who would be the partners in it, when it would take place, where and how. Um, so we had, 
I had several phone calls with Rafiq and Carla and I, we met uh, Sugwen in London where she was mentioning about um, some work that she was doing that would be like a telepresent type performance. Um, and this telepresentness would play quite an important role um, with how we would take the exhibition forward. Um, I'd like to just jump in and say that she was developing it because of environmental concerns, wasn't she? She didn't want to fly so much. And she, in, this was in January, mm. and she was thinking this would be a way of preventing her having to fly. Yeah, that's and, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think what we should do now is say that both of these works are, were winners. Uh, Rafiq Anadol's Melting Memories was the gold award winner of the, of the Lumen Prize 2019. And so Gwen Chung and Drawing Operations was the Still Image Award winner for 2019. And, I, and I'd like now to show uh, Rafiq Anadol's video on... Uh, on the vi on Vimeo, if we could bring that up, that would be great for a couple of minutes. And maybe Toro, you could talk a little bit about why you like this work. Yeah, um, the melting memory. I mean, the summer, the summer, the digital summer exhibitions that we are preparing. You know, they take place in Hall One, which is the ground floor in our museum, and it is maybe one of the larger halls. You know, it's really high ceiling and kind of a beautiful space. And when I first watched uh, this um, installation, this data sculpture, I almost, it looked like me, like it was in the whole one. It really fills the space in such a beautiful way. And I, th I think um, Rafik is very interesting in the way he works with visualization or say, augmentation of data. Mm. So it, it's, um, I think for me, I've seen, I've, I've worked with art and tech in many years and, and people have this kind of hesitation when it comes to technology. But I think his work kind of draws you in, in a way. It's not like you have to be very knowledgeable about this art field or something like that. It just, it's a very mesmerizing uh, work that I think it, it's a beautiful place to start, I think, for our audience where they are. They, yeah, it's, uh, it's a new thing, this art tech scene here in Kristiansand. And, and I think this is a, just draws people in. I've seen children responding to it, you know, our more core, core um, audience responding to it in a very, very interesting way. Yeah, I think it, it has quite a lot of accessible layers, doesn't it? You could see it as, as, a, as almost just a, a, a film, an artist film or, or video work. But then once, you know, you learn more about it and you understand that, you know, what, what these visuals are made from, um, you know, people's ECG memories and how that was translated into the visuals you're looking at, you're right, it is a great kind of entry point into media and processes as well as, um, you know, the, the, what, you, what you're looking at, definitely. Um, shall we maybe see an excerpt from one of uh, Su Gwen's performances using uh, the YouTube video next? So this is a, uh, yeah, here we go. This is a, an excerpt from a performance that Sogwen does called um, Drawing Operations, where she works, you know, collaboratively with, with robot drawing arms. And uh, you can see this is, this is what we, we had perhaps hoped to exhibit in the museum, would you say, Toro? Yes, this was the, the, the first uh, version of the, of, of the exhibition. We really wanted uh, Sogwen to be here. And... I really love the way she collaborates with the machines and so again you know this um bring this call they i think they both have a kind of an open and um they look at this collaboration between human memory and computer memory and really um yeah draw people in in a very uh, beautiful way i i love the the way um, i mean so Gwen has developed these performances over many uh, years and starting with a more like a mimic memory between, between the robotic arms that she programmed and developed herself. And then looking into more the, when, when she um, stored all 20 years of drawing into the, the memory of the robot, it took on a different role kind of this uh, collaboration. So it's a very, very interesting and beautiful performance. Yeah, and again, it, you know, the use of, of tr kind of traditional media and new media here is, is kind of a nice way in, I think, for audiences to kind of help understand and 
kind of uh, place in their own kind of art histories, you know, what, what, what these artists are doing, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I think now we, we might start talking about... Um, how it actually, <laughs> how it actually worked. Before, before we go into the technical side, I, you mentioned a couple of times, Toral, that you're introducing art and technology to um, perhaps a fairly conservative audience. And I'm interested in why the museum has this mission. Um, where does that come from? I mean, do you see it as the future or do you see it as something that's naturally developed? I mean, I'm just interested in, in a little bit more of your museum's um, yeah. reason for this. Our uh, art director, uh, she she expressed it very beautifully. I think, you know, she when you look at what's happening right now, you have you have uh, we look at other institutions or uh, universities like Royal College of Art. They are introducing tech um, subjects into the art education, and you also see like uh, you see, I mean, exhibitions like um, Team Lab. They are the most visited one one artist uh, museum in the world last year. So there is a big change going on that we can see. And um, I think she expressed it like she doesn't want us as a museum to watch and, you know, uh, to be kind of a passive observer of that change that is happening, but to really be part of it and even make a difference. And I think that's the motivation why we were so happy to connect with Lumen Art as well. And we want to see this, we want to see the artists working in this field in the Nordic countries also being part of that change and, and being part of that area that is kind of coming in a more stronger way, if you can say it. So that's why we collaborated with you about the Lumen Nordic. Right? Great. Well, thank you for that context. And I guess that takes us fairly neatly into now discussing the logistics of how things changed once the pandemic hit. And I assume that because these were works created digitally, they were born digital works that eased the way, they weren't pieces of sculpture that had to be shipped. Um, I'm assuming we just take that as a given that that helped, but you still had the problem of that you wanted Sunglum to attend, to do performances, and you wanted Rafiq to be at the opening and all these kinds of things. So can perhaps, Jack, you could take up the baton of how things switched when you realized there was going to be no travel, nobody was going anywhere, but yet the museum looked like it would be reopening in time for this show to go ahead. Well, Toro and I started working in a very different, more close way, I suppose, once we knew this was going to happen. We had a plan and that plan wasn't going to be a possibility whatsoever. So, you know, right down to things like Toro working out, would we, you know, if the gallery isn't open, what could we do? Coming up with, you know, ideas about, could we place equipment outside? Could we, um, you know, have timed viewings of, of different works? And as, as Toro was, you know, feverishly working through this, I was trying to connect with the artists who obviously had their own kind of conflicting calls on their time. And, what they were having to do perhaps with their families and arrangements they were having to make. So it was a, a kind of all hands on deck, no idea is a bad idea, let's see <laughs> where we end up. And, um, you know, working with Rafi, Toro and Seguen, we, we slowly were coming to ideas and um, ways of working. And then Toro, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about how logistically Rafi's work uses this large LED screen and ideas you were having about maybe placing that outside and, and you know, the, the logistic, you know, issues of, of changing an entire exhibition on the fly, but, but then, you know, what happened next, really? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it was a very strange time when everything was shut down, so, and we didn't really know, you know, how many people will be, when will be open, how is the, all this going to work? So we had to work on multiple kind of plans at the same time. And it was great to have that, you know, to have you there to be a part of that uh, journey. Um, you know, one of the elements, the, the original plan for Rafik and Suguen was the kind of shared space in a way, like this big hall, one part of it was more Rafik space, Rafik space and the other one, Suguen. And she had a very beautiful sketch for how to really show her performances 
you know, like Carla was saying, she was planning these telepresence performances as part of the exhibition, even if she would be there for the first one, you know, and maybe a second one. But, you know, this is all, all planned from the beginning and, you know, with the screen where you could see through and it, you know, would almost be like a, not a sculpture, but it will, will really fill that part of the space. And we just realized with all the regulations and, you know, people can't be so close to each other that this would, it would fill the space too much. So it would almost make it not really possible somehow, you know, you had to really prepare for that. So then one day I was, I don't remember, I was talking to you, Jack, and going through different ideas. Should we show this? Should we have the LED screen outside somewhere? And, you know, then I just hit me that if we, if we, instead of installing that second setup for so Gwen, that, that, that we combine them in the, in the LED screen and, uh, and ask so Gwen if she can work in that format. Then maybe it's possible to really have the public space where it's safe for people to move around and uh, yeah so that's uh, how it came about and and for me it was really interesting it was you know and, and the way we worked with the telepresence you know streaming going both ways and trying to get that shared space uh, feeling um it was interesting to see one of the first tests that we had when when her work was on the screen because it is a square you know it's not a 69 uh, image and i just realized you know how that format and maybe that platform made me look at her work in a way more like an image rather than a film somehow it kind of changed the way i perceived it and i found it really interesting and very beautiful i mean she she really you know changed kind of yeah formats of her work yeah, let, let me share my screen and show some of the uh the shots we had as we were going through this process and we can talk a little bit more detail about that i think um here we go so here we can see the uh the led screen being, yeah. being built here um and we should say that this was the first kind of plan we had wasn't was yeah, it yeah. so we had the led screen um taking up one kind of end and then a platform where perhaps the performance with the, the telepresent performance with the robots was going to go with some paintings around and, and documentary film um, yeah. and then we moved to having the performance on the screen as you were saying so here we can see that so this is me looking through Microsoft Teams at the install live in the space with Toro and the, and the great technicians he had there whilst watching another stream looking out into the gallery so from uh, this kind of angle um, so that I was able to, to help Toro kind of plan everything out and, and see where we were going. Um, so here you can see this is kind of a, a still of, of what the performances were would plan to be looked like on the LED screen. So having the LED screen was the solution in a, in a sense having Rafiq's re, what Rafiq required to show his work ended up working well for Sugwen, which is really an incredibly happy coincidence. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and, and that means that you could have much uh, more spaced out visitors in the room so that you didn't have to have crowds. How many people can you get into that space now that the exhibition is open? Uh, we have, I think we have a, um, a rule that it has to be one, about one meter in between people. So uh, on the on the planned performances that we have, I think we can have around forty people uh, in the room. And and how did the how did the opening go? Was that um, I mean, how did it work? I'm sure it was a successful evening, but how did it work to have an opening with just forty people yeah, and, and, and a, a remote artist giving a performance? What was that like? Yeah. Uh, it was strange. I mean, uh, so when I had the privilege of meeting her when I visited New York earlier this year, but uh, Rafik, I never, you know, met him in person. So it's a little bit, you know, felt a little bit strange to be in this situation where you really haven't met kind of really face to face. But it, it kind of in some way fits the area that we are in. Um, no, the, the, exit, the opening night was also different because we usually have are open to members, you know, you really have a, quite large crowds on these events, but we, we had to limit it down to 100 and, and have it outside uh, so people wouldn't be, have to stand too close and yeah, 
it was um, it was a success, but it was it had a different feeling than than normal. Than normal. The normal, yeah. Well, do you feel that you can now that you understand the new normal is is what they're describing it that this will inform other exhibitions and if so, what do you feel the main messages, the main lessons that you both have learned from this in terms of approaching the planning of exhibitions now in this new socially distant world that we live in? Is there, is there a, a sort of a takeaway that you've got for other people who might be watching that are wondering how they're going to start planning new exhibitions for their spaces? Yeah, I'm just like really grateful for the flexibility of the artist and of you as the partners as well. You really have to be, you have to be really open-minded and, and really not scared maybe to suggest new ways of doing things, you know. Um, I mean, it's also sensitive when you, when you don't have that um, time with the artist working face to face. And, uh, but I think we are all used to meetings in zoom and you know this kind of um, so well um what was my take spend time talking together <laughs> don't be afraid of of uh, sharing ideas even if you think it might not work you really have to really throw up try to look at things from a new perspective and um yeah it's been very okay. i know jack I would say that, you know, this was perhaps a unique case because we thought for quite some time that the exhibition wouldn't open. And it was that how can we still bring the exhibition to people? How can we still share these ideas and this work? Um, and kind of going through that process kind of allowed us, as, as Toro was saying, to, to kind of think literally outside of the white box and put it on the outside of the box. And, and, um, and then once we slowly, as kind of the rules about uh, social distancing and opening and crowd control were coming in we kind of again had to rethink how we were going to do things right down to are we allowed to have people to have headphones um you know you? Can you? work between two different you know sources if we can't have headphones are we going to have to kind of work with the artist to have kind of one silent time maybe one other time um and so as Toro was saying that kind of constant more than usual communication and to keep people updated about plans that you don't know if they're going to happen in three weeks time or what you know is the museum going to open when and are people even going to want to come and how to kind of keep a level head and relax and enjoy the process as much as possible because it, it was very unique i must say the meetings we had in the space where usually i would be present with the artists and toro would be there doing them over uh over conference calls and with multiple different views of cameras, it kind of mimicked the exhibition in quite some way, you know. I think it was quite, a, I'd really liked that experience, you know, in the evenings, kind of matching the time zones together and, and coming and helping out with, remotely helping out with, uh, with the installation was a very new experience. And one I think that we could probably do again in the future with some more refining and learning how best to kind of me be telepresent and everyone be telepresent in the gallery was a was kind of a fun experience i would say yeah. so, and i think it also sparked one of the i mean in the middle of this thing when we didn't know if we would be able to open anything i mean we started thinking like many other uh, locations as well if are we able to do this virtually could we, mm -hmm. could we build the gallery you know somewhere in the virtual world and have this exhibition there and this is one of our future projects now that we will start in the autumn. So it has kind of generated some new ways of thinking and working and taking maybe these things more seriously as well. And I think, you know, people and just even if all the contacts we've had has been, you know, virtual, uh, I think we really appreciate from, from all this period, we really appreciate being together. I mean, even if we were just 100 people on the opening, we really appreciated being able to be there and be together and experience this together. It was kind of a new appreciation. That's, that's an amazingly wonderful result, isn't it? That we're also grateful now for the interactions that we do have. I just wanted to quickly follow up on a couple of points you both made. Are headphones part of it? And um, you, you are able to use those uh, yeah. somehow hygienically clean your headphones? 
Yeah, we were you, we were able to use them, but we have to have some um, system on on they being clean Clean, cleaning. And and I also wanted to ask you why the numbers. I, the show's been open now for a few days. How, are people willing to come back to museums? I mean, Norway is way ahead of where we are here in the UK. Everything is still shut. So we're wondering, even when things do open in the cultural sector, if people will feel confident enough to go to new exhibitions. Do you feel that the numbers are what you'd hope for or a little bit less? Or what are you seeing so far, if you can make a generalization? It has been a little bit... Um, um, since we opened in beginning or of mid June, it has been a little bit slow. We noticed that, you know, but um, since Christiansand, we haven't had that many cases, and it looks like we handled the Norway kind of handled this situation in a in a way that managed to keep things in control. People are starting to relax, mm -hmm. but it is a very careful uh, situation, even though so. I think people, I, I noticed people were, like I said, you know, eager to come back and, and be part of this event. So I think it will, it, I think it will move in the right direction from now on. That's fantastic news and great news for the rest of us who are so eagerly looking forward to our own cultural institutions reopening. Um, I think we're about ready to wrap up. Is there any sort of comments or um, uh, reflections on the experience that either of you would like to make before we wind up? Uh, I suppose I would say I'm looking forward to our next project together that Toro briefly mentioned about working in this kind of digital space as, as a team in this way um, and what that might bring and you know I've definitely learned a lot more about bit rates <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and how that dramatically can affect uh, you know, a very important telepresent performance, I suppose. <laughs> um, Toral, uh, um, how about you? How do you look forward to the summer for the museum? Do you think it'll, it, it gradually gets busier and you see projects and opportunities starting to open up again? Yeah, I think we are very hopeful and very excited for the summer. And um, I've, I've seen a lot of, uh, on social media, I've seen a lot of posts already from the, from the exhibition. So that makes me really excited for this first digital exhibition at the... Uh, so, if people who are watching this panel want to watch Su Gwen's performances, will you be recording them? Will they be able to go to your website? No, they won't, Jack is saying. So you're not actually going to have videos. It's either you're watching the live performances in the museum. It's, it's really for your actual audience. You're not... Yeah, so yeah. The virtual experience that Jack's talking about will be the next project. You're not trying to layer virtual on top of this one it's enough for us at the moment to have. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, definitely. And, and i think as well it makes the performances much more meaningful for the people that are there you know they're one of a very few people that will see this and experience it over it being streamed i just wanted to make sure that our audience understands that the, it's an interactive performance that the people's movements in the studio interact with the artist as she's performing, correct? And she picks up data from them. So it is, must be a very moving experience. I, I hope we can get there before the show closes. That would be really wonderful. Um, the other uh, tip I wanted to pass on to our viewers before we stop is that I know Jack and Charles kept their Skype open. <laughs> <laughs> so when the green button on Skype opened, they knew each other were there and we could just type. So they had a kind of instant communication that didn't bother the other one. And um, that's a kind of nice open channel communication that we can now do for each other in this world that doesn't bother, it isn't phone calls and it doesn't bother, but it, it allows for closer communication, doesn't it? And yeah, communication was, was definitely the key. Um, yeah. Which... Um, I, think, I think for me that was the takeaway, is understanding how you two communicated was amazing. Um, and so we're really grateful for you sharing your experiences here today with this panel. And thank you very much for being part of this. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye-bye.